Welcome to our AJA Lunchtime Live. I'm Kimberly Carroll and I'm the Director of Animal Justice Academy. Our topic today, folks, a big vision for the animal freedom movement. And we have joining us Leila Kassam from the Animal Think Tank in the UK. I wanna welcome all you brilliant beings that are here with us live. Welcome to those of you who are watching the replay and welcome to Leila. It's so good to have you here, Leila. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you, Kimberly. Oh, so let, let me give you, before I start picking your brain, let me give folks a little bit of background, okay? So um, first of all, the UK-based animal think tank, ATT, was formed in 2018 by Leila Kassam and others who felt um, that the key to taking the animal freedom movement to the next level lay in thorough research and planning and looking to successful major um, social movements for inspiration. So ATT is putting into place like big picture organizational structures and exploring cutting edge strategies that we're hoping can enable thousands, hopefully millions of people to participate, more people to participate in the animal freedom movement and of course change the course of history. Um, so uh, not only is Layla founder and director of Animal Think Tank, she's co-editor of the book Rethinking Food and Agriculture, that's how I got introduced to her, uh, New Ways Forward, which envisions a truly just and sustainable food system. She's also co-founder of the Veterinarian, uh, veterinary Vegan Network and Ethical Globe. Uh, Layla has been involved in social change for most of her career, having previously worked in the international development sector for 15 years, working with NGOs, uh, foundations, government ministries, and international research institutions. Her work focused on conducting research on poverty and food security for rural development projects in sub-Saharan um, Africa and South Asia. Layla has a PhD in development economics. Layla, you're a bit of a slacker, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, lady, what a resume. Love it. I don't even want to know how old you are because you look like a child. So I, <laughs> I'm like, how have you done all of this? Unbelievable. I'm definitely not a child. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, but okay. So one of the things I just want to kind of um, ask you about before we dig in is um, you've got quite a Canadian connection. So tell us about how all that works. Well, <clears throat> my sister, Zara, who's um, watching, she lives in Toronto um, and she moved there from the UK. I don't know how long ago, over a decade ago at least, um, with her husband and she's there with her family. And then my, both my parents, um, their families, many of them are in, in uh, Canada as well, in Calgary, Vancouver. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are an honorary Canadian, basically. I think so. I think that's so. That's amazing. But the, it sounds like they're all leaving you <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> hey. Well, yeah, the UK is kind of cold and miserable. Not at the moment, but generally. So. <laughs> uh, well, we, we would adopt you anytime you want to come over. <laughs> um, okay, Layla, people are so anxious to hear a little about, about some of these strategies that ATT is working with. Um, first of all, what is Animal Think Tank? Give us a little lay of the land here? Sure. Um, well, Animal Think Tank is a grassroots social movement organization with a big vision um, to basically achieve animal freedom in the UK. It's a UK-based organization. Um, and we're aiming to do this by organizing and mobilizing people to enable them to undertake a nonviolent action and civil disobedience um, by seeding a social movement organization. And we're kind of envisioning that at the moment um, as a network of movement groups across the UK that can be autonomous, that can run their, their own campaigns um, and can also come together um, for coordinated national actions within the sort of strategic framework that we are also developing. So that's one piece of it. Um, and then in time, we also want to seed uh, and support other organizations in other parts of the movement ecology. Um, and one of the really important conceptual frameworks that we use um, is this idea of a social movement ecology. Um, when you look at past social justice um, movements that have been successful, they have had organizations and groups in all different you know, areas of the ecology with different theories of change. So individual um, transformation. So we've got that with vegan outreach building alternatives like sanctuaries, plant-based proteins. And then there's, you know, this area of shifting dominant institutions in society. So party politics, lobbying, 
um, structure-based organizing and mass protest. And so, you know, all of those pieces are really, really important. Um, and we've got quite an immature movement ecology really in, I mean, we're quite, well, yeah, in the UK at least, and we're quite a young movement, um, even though there is this long history. But when I think about the development world and how much, um, you know, how much more, how many more organizations, money, all of that is there, you know, there, there's, there's so much to, there's so much potential um, for us to make change. Well, and, and if the UK is immature, then and North America, we're extremely immature because I think you folks are at least 10 years ahead of us in, in a lot of animal, uh, animal freedom a movement sort of uh, uh, goalposts. Um, so, okay, so it's such a big vision and I love it, but it kind of blows up my brain a little bit. Um, how, how did ATT come to be? Like, what, mm -hmm. what was the biggest need that, that you and this group, you know, saw out there and you just went, we need to do something that's not there. And I'm, I'm hearing it, it, it has something to do with, with structure and it has to do with this ecology. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, ATT started, there was three of us, myself, Mark Westcombe and Dan Kidby. Um, and we all kind of had our own journeys to then meeting. Um, and all of us individually, I think, um, in different ways had come to the conclusion that structural change is necessary and that social movements were the way to make social uh, to make structural change because you know we're talking about this massive entrenched system um, mm -hmm. that needs serious power in order to make any kind of uh, transformative change um, and specifically to do with the ecology um, in the UK at least at the time that we um, you know see, uh, started Animal Think Tank in 2018 I think it was there were no mass protests type organizations mm -hmm. in the UK ecology. I mean, now we've got Animal Rebellion, which is just, it's so wonderful, but we yep. need more. Yes. Um, uh, and so that, I think that was, that was one of the needs um, to, to fill, you know, we often say we, we're trying to fill that gap in the ecology. Mm -hmm. And the important part of that piece of the ecology is when you look at past social justice movements, it's, it's that part of the ecology that then catalyzes and creates opportunity mm -hmm. um, for the rest of the ecology to, you know, to, to do their thing and to make it easier to, for them to do their, to their, to, to do their thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's really important that that is there in all the ecologies um, oh, in Canada and the UK. Where totally I'm, get it. Um, it's so it's it's kind of the opposite of, of thinking that we're going to change things from the outside the inside out it's yeah. that we do need to have that aspect but the only way there's going to be enough pressure for those that are on the inside to get any leverage is if there is major pressure from the outside that that is 100 true it's like you, you can't we can't do it we can't just do the inside game alone without that um pressure from the outside and we can't just do the pressure from the outside without connections on the inside um and so when the when this ecology um, works really well it's not when the different parts of it are saying well i've got the right way and you're doing it wrong it's where we all understand the different theories of change of the different organizations and can work in synergy and have creative tensions and maybe conflict but in a way that's really generative and that's kind of that's you know that's my vision at least and i think that's att's vision as well a really a rich and vibrant ecology working together Mm. You know, this is really speaking to part of how Animal Justice Academy came to be. I mean, animal justice has been around for, what, 13 or 14 years now. And we really just sort of felt that um, we're doing all this inside work legislatively, undercover investigations, media wise. But, but to have a powerful group of people on the ground is necessary in a lot of our, in a lot of our actions to get that pressure. And we've seen that. It's not even that huge of a group, but uh, a dedicated, educated group um, applying pressure from the outside, you know, is, it has been incredible. And, and not necessarily with mass protests, but with, again, mass um, political sort of um, actions um, and within our, with our, our, our reps and everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and you know, I, I'm talking about mass protests, but targeted pressure kind of campaigns, it doesn't take that many people in order to, as long as you're coordinated and you have a focus, I really feel that there's, there's, 
you know, at the moment, I sort of when I look when I'm looking at the UK, there's lots of campaigns, but it, I don't feel like there's that much coordination or focus on a particular point where we could really make change. Um, so yeah, I really applaud that your vision and your realization for Animal Justice Academy is so important. Well, and so can so I, I I want to really get clear on uh, on the vision, and so the idea is to create also connections between the various groups. Is that part part of the vision? Yeah, it is part of the vision. And when you know when you're saying I'd like to get clear on the vision, I'd also like to get clear on the vision. We're still you know we're still really in the middle of of developing it, and you know we've grown from a a group of three to um, soon will be 14 full-time people um, and you know with all of their you know insight and knowledge and experience it's kind of the vision is developing um, but at the moment it's um, you know we're we're thinking of a kind of if we think about a kind of yeah let's say uh, an inner circle of movement groups that are coordinated by a particular uh, structure let's say and then and then a wider federation, uh, which that you know group of movement groups is part of then a wider federation that kind of align with certain principles and values, our strategic vision, and that could include lots of different types of organizations. So it will end up being ATT, the movement groups, other organizations. Um, it sounds and, like Star Wars. I love it. <laughs> the Federation. <laughs> the Federation. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, I think the Federation was good. It's the Empire that's bad, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah. that's, you know, and we're still, we've got a social movement governance person who only came on less than six months ago doing research into all these different types of structures. What would make sense for us? And we've, so far we've settled on a Federation, but, you know, that will take time to come. First, we need to get the movement groups going. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing to say is that, um, you know, the theory of change that we're following, momentum driven organizing, and based on this book, This is an Uprising, a really important aspect of being able to unite um, different groups um, is a, a shared narrative or a meta narrative. And often, if you can get groups to buy into and co create with you, a narrative that lands with people, often the strategic unity comes. You know after that it kind of follows um so that's another piece of like creating i guess some kind of unity um uh developing a narrative that other groups can can also use and have messaging and stories come from that sort of deeper meta narrative mm. so how does this idea sort of differ from say uh the save movement mm -hmm. that where you know there is a, an overall sort of uh narrative and the vigils um and there's groups that are sort of self-formed around the world um is this just a, like a bigger version of that or 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 i guess what you're saying is is actually taking from very different parts of the ecology so not just on the street activism but you're involving you know again uh, uh vegan uh, sort of maybe even vegan companies or vegan um lobby groups um mm -hmm. and you're and is that is that a correct sort of assumption yeah and i think you know when i'm talking about the federation that's in the that's very much in the future at the moment we are focusing on the so social movement organization so i'm going to interpret interpret your question as what's the difference between the social movement organization we're, we're seeding right now and yeah. groups like save and i think you know there's there's a lot of similarity but i think structurally there's probably something different we really want um local groups to be or movement groups they're not all going to be local they might be in uh they might be different types of groups autonomous and have and be able to run their own local campaigns and really build their strategic capacity and because you know we're not going to have the best ideas for campaigns at the center it's there's so much creativity mm -hmm. out there um and then be able to come together for those coordinated national campaigns and mm -hmm. i have to say that i love what save is doing with the plant-based treaty i feel that's really really you know it's uh, it's moved on from the vigils which i also thought were wonderful um and one part of for example doing vigils was you know we're, we're really focused on es like focused and escalating campaigns and you know making wins shifting public opinion that's kind of our, our theory of change so we might have a slightly different theory of change to some of these other organizations that might look similar on the outside and i think the theory of change and the theory of power that underlies the theory of change is something that's really really important um, to bear in mind when we're looking at these different groups.
Mm, interesting. Um, you know, speaking of the term theory of change, I mean, that's bandied around a lot, but can you just give folks a little rundown of what that means and, and why you think it's so important for groups yeah. to have a theory of change? Okay. Well, I mean, it, it is what it says on the tin. It is, it is our beliefs of how change or theory of how change is made in society. Um, and I mentioned the theory of power being a really important part of that. So if our theory of power is what is called like a monolithic theory of power, where you imagine a triangle and power is located at the top with, you know, um, policymakers and lawyers and lobbyists and government, which is, by the way, what we've been conditioned to believe, which makes us feel that, you know, people don't have the power. Yeah, so that is, mm -hmm. Right. So that is one theory of power and often you know there is a theory of change then that's like focused on changing those at the top um, through lobbying or through um, you know campaigning you know CEOs or, or whatever it is um, and then there's the social view of power which is actually power is with the people and we give our power away generally to those people at the top um, but it also means that we can take our power back through uh, you know and uh, disobedience basically mm -hmm. um, and 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 not being you know you're not giving it away and so for us um that we have the social view of power and most mass protest movements do because it's people powered but that means that our theory of change then is about it's not about getting to government it is about shifting public opinion mm -hmm. and um, then like getting them to get to government yeah and <laughs> exactly it's mm -hmm. because it's the idea that government will follow where the once the public has has shifted and so with these mass protest movements it is about shifting the political weather as i said before and so it's it's really focused on public opinion it's not focused on sort of the instrumental demands of incremental reform um, uh -huh. uh. and, and your question was why is it important well if you want to make change you need to know how how you think change is going to be made otherwise it's not going to be a very focused effort um, and I think it's really important also to understand different theories of change so you can understand what other organizations are doing and how those different theories of change can support each other. Because actually not one theory of change is correct. Like we do need all of it. Not one theory of power is, it's like we've got different truths, different perspectives. So ultimately it all has to come together, I think. Mm. Well, and so um, at Animal Think Tank, you take a lot of inspiration from major social movements uh, re of recent times or much further back times. Um, why is that such a cornerstone of your mission? Why, why did you um, migrate to that? What, like, was there a sort of turning point that you went, oh, wow, we are not utilizing some of the basics in the animal freedom movement? Well, I think, um, I think going back to the beginning, or maybe even pre beginning of Animal Think Tank, um, you know, all of us had our different journeys. And I think, um, I think there was a general sense for all of us. And I can't speak for the others, but you know, I know for Mark, for example, he his journey was like he read this book about the transatlantic slave trade, and it was kind of like, oh my goodness, we need to do this for other animals. Um, Dan had his own history, being part of um, Occupy LSC, and was in you know in that uh, you know uh, of, yeah that social movement of Occupy, and I think that was very transformative for him. And for me, I've always felt social movements are really important. I just didn't know that I could start. Well, I could help create one. I was always somebody who would just go to marches or go to protests. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thought that um, we could actually create something, um, it wasn't until I met Mark and Dan that I realized um, actually, uh, you know, we could. And that idea is so exciting. And also I think it's such a cornerstone of our mission because A, it's so inspiring. And B, when you look at all of the progress, so many of the progressive changes that have happened, um, in history, um, you know, they've all involved some form of mass protest, civil disobedience, social movements, people power, and it's, you know, it can be contested how much those play a role, but they, we can't contest that they have played a massive role. Mm -hmm. um, and because we weren't seeing that in the animal freedom movement, it just seemed like, and again, as I said about the structural change, like, I don't, you know, when I became vegan, you know, I was an advocate, I would, um, I wouldn't do outreach on the streets, but I would to anybody who would listen. And at some point, I was just like, how is this going to, how is this going to make the structural change that I know is needed? Because it's, it's, you know, the sort of, I mean, it, it's making cultural change, which is so important. We can't have the structural without the cultural. It's, it's like, 
you know, two sides of the same coin. Um, but yeah, I think knowing that we need structural change, um, I think is, was a real motivator for focusing on the social movement side of things. Mm. So it is, it's, it's, it's like, we are already doing a lot of these things. We already do, are already uh, doing protests and, um, and, mm. uh, you know, we're showing up, we're doing street activism yeah. um, and we're doing, but we aren't doing it in a coordinated way. We aren't yeah. doing it in a coordinated yeah. enough way is, is, is what you're, you might be saying. Yes. And I think the other thing to, I mean, I think what came to mind when you said that, because you're right, we are doing all these things. Um, but if, if, I mean, in the UK, Extinction Rebellion was like this big thing that came onto the scene a few years ago. And it was, you know, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. Um, and it grew exponentially very, very quickly and created a huge amount of disruption and real moments, what people call moments of the whirlwind, where suddenly so many people were, were really getting inspired and starting to take action um, in the name of the movement. And they followed um, what we're following, this, this organizing theory called momentum-driven organizing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, it's a particular way of building people power um, through you know, using nonviolent direct action um, to es and escalating, you know, campaigns um, where you really uh, create this drama, for, you know, because we're really trying to act, you know, we're acting on society and we're trying to dramatize the issue to kind of really force it into the public consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so that's called, es you know, escalation. So you, you might start with something, um, it, well, I don't know, I'm thinking about, let's say, the, the Nashville uh, lunch counter sit-ins, they did the, the sit-ins, and then um, it escalated to a, a massive public march to, you know, to the governor's house, and it, would, it and loads of people were getting involved, and it, they didn't stop until, you know, uh, they won, and it, so it's that kind of escalation, and then having the structures to absorb all of that momentum that is then created is something that mass protest movements historically have not really uh, all had you know often it's a sort of flash in the pan and then it all just um disappears and so being able to i guess front load channel it, it yes exactly into yeah. structures to sort of really take advantage of that momentum and train people up so one of the ways is by absorbing people through mass trainings putting them into groups extinction rebellion did this really well they would do trainings and they would put us into affinity groups so that you can give us the tools and the kind of these are the roles you need to go out and take you know independent direct action or whatever it is that you want to do and then that leads to increasing public support and active public support and then the cycle goes round again so um i agree we're doing these things but i'm not sure we're doing them in that way mm -hmm. um, yeah we're doing little bits but it, it's it yeah. really is that organization factor i mean really being very deliberate about uh and if you look at the civil rights movement you know yes seeding it with all these um uh, acts of uh, civil disobedience and then it growing and growing until you know this the, yeah. they've got enough allies to do a huge march um and and then you're right like what's the message where is that going to what you know and and i think again there are groups out there that are doing some of this but it's just not um it's not as coordinated as as it could be for us to really have power um you know you talk a lot about um in animal think tank about the science of social change you know um and and so that's part of what i'm hearing here is is that maybe we've been driven a lot by passion which is really important but the degree of um exactness and planning uh mm. it may be maybe that has been lacking a little yeah potentially and obviously we need passion and social movements are the things that that channel that passion and grief and frustration into actual um, action and, and, and change um, and you know I'm thinking gosh do we talk about the science of social change I'm, I'm you know it's so it's an art as much as a science ah. um, but I think I think yes there are some things which I think you know people who've been around um, on the on the sort of organizing scene would know for example this idea that um, if we want to make uh, if you want to make change we need to get the active and sustained um, support uh, of 3.5% of the population based on a, a study by Chenoweth and Stevens, why civil resistance works, where they looked at over 300 national campaigns and found that none of them failed once they, they had reached, um, you know, 3.5% of the population active and sustained 
support many with much less and you know support active and sustained support means voting um, petitioning uh you know civil disobedience like a whole range of things persuasion um so so there's there's bits like that that i think that we really do feel a part of our theory of change that come from evidence um uh, and i would also say you know around the ecology and the movement cycle there's a theorist called bill moyer um, who was also an activist in many movements, including the civil rights movement, and became a, a, a social movement theorist. And he talks about the different roles that are found in the different social in different social movements: the rebel, the direct action activist, um, the reformer, um, the citizen, and the change maker. So, and they can map on to what what we have in the animal movement. So, so we we draw a lot from you know different places. And then organizing methodologies, Marshall Gantz is somebody that we also um, draw from in terms of the relational community organizing, you know, he was um, really, uh, he was an organizer in the, uh, uh, oh my goodness. Nonviolent. Farmers uh, movement. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, with Cesar Chavez. Um, and, you know, he's, he's now at Harvard and he's, you know, written loads on it. So we do draw a lot on, on experience, on best practice, um, and I would just, I would advocate for people to read this as an uprising because it's a really brilliant, easy, re easy-ish read. I couldn't put it down. And it gives such a great um, overview of a lot of the literature and the experience of these social movements. And I think that could inspire us a lot um, to take what resonates and help us do the things that we're doing better. Mm. With, uh, you know, one uh, thing I, I read through Animal Think Tank was, was about, um, the Indian independence movement and how much Gandhi like did strategizing and pre-planning for what years? Yeah, I mean, I often hear that it spent 10 years, 15 years um, strategizing. And I also, you know, have read that, you know, he, when he wanted to start building this, this um, movement, he realized that people weren't ready because they didn't know they were in power. And so he spent a year, you know, getting people to do local campaigns so that the winnable campaigns so that they could feel their agency and feel empowered to then do bigger and um yeah bigger things and i think we have to do that as well i mean i don't i don't necessarily feel my own power i mean how many of us have really made significant change in the world in a way that's like yes i can really feel my own agency so this is a much this is this project is as much for my own empowerment as it is for you know for all of us and and i think that excites me as much you know almost as much as the possibility of animal freedom it's it's taking our power back um mm. I love that. And, and Leila, I have to say, I was just talking to somebody yesterday about uh, the animal freedom movement. Now, we, I, I always struggle, still struggle with what to call it. I mean, it was the animal rights movement forever. And then, um, and that now that's kind of got a, you know, bad rap in a lot of the public's mind. And then there's the animal protection movement, but then some people feel like that doesn't, you know, that doesn't go far enough. And then animal liberation movement, people are like, I don't even know what the hell that is. Um, but I love animal freedom movement. I'm like, I, that really resonates. I don't oh. know, how, how about for the folks out there? It, does that resonate for you, animal freedom movement? Yeah, there's a lot of nodding heads here. So um, yeah, did you it, did it take you a while to go kind of land on that? Well, no, do you know, it's so interesting. And I'm so I'm so happy to get that feedback. Because mm. um, one of the one of our, you know, work streams, as I mentioned, is about narrative and framing our message in a way that lands with people. And the thing is that we, we often think that change, you know, we can change people by being more Really right and having all the best arguments and like you know reaching people's logic and actually we're emotional beings and we have to be able to speak to people's emotions and resonate with their hearts ultimately from my perspective um and so in the um, freedom to marry movement which um the narrative team takes a lot of inspiration from they shifted from uh sort of the right to marry narrative to a kind of freedom to love have families etc and that played a massive role in um their success um and so we've kind of you know we're doing narrative research and we've got um a corpus linguist and all of that but in the meantime we are like well freedom clearly resonates um with a broad spectrum of people um and yeah like you i'm like what does liberation mean it's, it feels like quite a 
a lefty thing. It's not going to resonate with, you know, the yeah. majority of the public. And similarly with rights, rights is, a, a, again, you know, seen as kind of quite a, a left wing sort of framing. And if we're trying to reach... And people like, oh, are we, are we going to let cows vote? Like, it's just like, yeah, yeah it just opens up the door yeah. for a lot of nonsense. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. yeah exactly. So I, I'm really happy to hear that. And I, I mean, we always joke that um, we're going to end up doing all this research and we're going to end up being called the animal lover movement or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, because you know in the UK at least we're a nation of animal lovers and if we're trying to reach people and help them identify with our movement maybe that's the thing so we might end up with, with something that we won't like but if it resonates and it lands then it will do the trick. Um, now um, you know it, it sounds like you are uh, ATT is so focused on what are the most promising activism strategies um, and so what are some things that are coming up that excite you? I mean, we've already talked about momentum-driven organizing, extremely, uh, you know, interesting narrative framing. Can you talk a little bit about like swarm organizing and, you know, and some of the other strategies that, that are exciting you right now? Well, I mean, I think, you know, when you say strategies, I think um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting them in this sort of much broader sense, because for me, and I've been focusing on the culture piece um, of Animal Think Tank and, and the groups that we're trying to seed, um, and, you know, the idea that culture, either everything is culture or culture eats strategy for breakfast, and I think culture is very much part of our strategy. Um, so things like our structures and our culture are really exciting me, because I think, you know, we, we can have the best strategic ideas um, but if we can't work together and you know there's so much conflict um, and you know most of us are not really skilled in, in managing uh, or transforming conflict um, and we have to learn um, so being able to develop the structure and the culture to be to create the conditions for people to thrive and work together in order to to surface the creative ideas etc it's something that is very close to my heart and which I've spent most of the last few years focusing on um, uh, and in terms of strategies well I think again it's like we're trying to create the conditions and get you know get best practice and what have you um, and, and be, make that accessible to others um, and so we've got um, somebody we've recruited a political strategist um, about six months ago to really look into our sort of strategy triangle it's kind of like what is our grand objective what are the strategic milestones that we need to achieve to get there and I think just on a tangent I feel like one of the things that I think Animal Think Tank is bringing or wants to bring is that kind of high level meta strategy um, because you know, as I, you know, as I said before, there's lots of things happening, but it's not necessarily all focused. All these different campaigns aren't focused on, for example, I don't know, ending subsidies, or I mean, you're doing more work on that in the in Canada, I think, than we are in the UK, or or a specific milestone. And to be able to have different campaigns that are trying to push the needle on a specific topic, whether it's ending factory farming as the first milestone, or whether it's ending artificial breeding as a, as a milestone to get us to the next one, you know, it's, it's coming up with something, um, a narrative and a strategy with those milestones that others can get behind. And then lots of different campaigns can emerge. Um, we're, we're having a campaign a one day next week where we're going to do a campaign planning session as the first campaign for our pilot local groups. We're using um, a methodology called story based strategy. So it's not kind of like, let's pick a target and let's, you know, pick some tactics. It's uh, it's kind of trying to deconstruct the story of our opposition and then create a campaign and an action logic that disrupts that story. So it's a it's a different way of looking at campaigning, and I feel like it has huge promise. So I guess what I'm can saying you, can is you, can, Leila, because that sounds that's fascinating. It, it, mm. I, know, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is there a, a chance you could give a little example of that? of, of uh, the story-based planning, like, um, you know, if a group was going to do that, like, I don't know if, it, again, this might be hard to do off the top of your head, but an example that you might have? Well, an example of the process or of yeah. an actual, final, of the process. Well, well, it's funny because I just reviewed the process the other day and I'm trying to think what, what was, what were the, so it's kind of deconstructing, uh, well, okay, I think the first step um, is understanding what the goal, the target, your audience and your constituents are for your campaign. Mm -hmm. So it might be, you know, our first campaign, the goal might just be getting a bunch of vegans active because, you know, there's a whole load of non-politically active or not, not, not non-active vegans um, uh, 
um, that I think would be part of our base or young people. So depending on who our constituents are, deciding who our audience is. Um, now then the next stage would be thinking about, um, I'm probably doing this in the wrong order to the actual methodology, but it's um, thinking about the story of your opponent. So maybe it's because um, you've picked your target. So it might be, it might be something really big about the story of speciesism or, or that you know, eating animals is natural and nice and necessary. Um, and so really deconstructing that. And there are different parts. There's five parts to a story, the conflict, the characters, and I, I can't remember all of them. I, I'd be very happy to share a link to uh -huh. the handout that we're using. Uh -huh. um, and, and then it's moving on to, okay, knowing your audience um, and really understanding who they are and then picking a point of intervention um, uh, that really speaks to all the things that you've surfaced um, in the previous steps. And then it's how you're going to intervene, which is kind of your tactics and, and how you're really gonna, at that point, you'll have your sort of your counter story, I suppose. And how do you tell that story through your tactics and through your campaign? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, so, so, yeah. You're, so you're taking the opponent's story, mm -hmm. um, you're finding the point in that story that like is is a is a turning point basically you're trying to destroy that you know like you're trying to destroy yeah, you that to disrupt you're, it. yeah you're disrupting that storyline yeah. and and mm -hmm. so you decide what is the part of the storyline that you're going to disrupt then how are you going to disrupt that disrupt yeah. that yeah. yeah and what are the and tactics yes and can i just say that i am the least expert in this narrative is not my field so yeah no me, problem i put you on the spot but I was i'm so sorry no i was fascinated by it and yeah, yeah. please i'm gonna ask you you know for you to give me a little list um Layla, of some of the things you've mentioned um we put a few of the links in um but yes. so that i can share it in the animal justice academy group facebook group and um because yes. people are asking yes, for absolutely. resources that would be great um and and yes. there's so and, many resources yes. on animal think tank right Yes, what I would say is that most of our key resources are on our website, but I will, you know, we've got a reading list and, you know, various courses and I don't know what else. So I'll definitely share that um, with you and some of the other things that I've mentioned and anything else I can think of. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's bring it down because, uh, and I love, I think we're really enjoying the the vision and the headiness of this, but if you are someone who is starting an organization, starting a group, okay, say you're, you, you know, you're volunteering, no, not even any staff people, what do you feel would be a couple of the first things that they should consider as far as not just jumping in without deliberateness? What, you know, would it be a strategic vision? Would it be a theory of change? You know, any, what, what, what would you say if you were starting it that, yeah. you know, knowing that they don't maybe have tons of bandwidth, but, you know, to get started yeah. on the right foot? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I would say is to educate yourselves a little bit um, and read some you know, I would recommend this is an uprising, um, you know, really. So I, I think one of the key things is, is yeah, educating ourselves. Um, and I think, secondly, with groups, um, we, I think the, the most important thing is to have a purpose, um, to have a clear, a clear uh, understanding of your mission, however small or big that's going to be. Um, and, you know, often groups get into trouble and there's, you know, uh, tensions and conflict and all of that. And we think it's interpersonal. And actually, often it's because we don't have that purpose behind which to unite. And so then all sorts of other things happen. So I would say, get your mission sorted. What are you trying to do? What is your theory of change? Are you going to um, be trying to do direct action because you have a theory of change and a theory of power that aligns with that? Or are you trying to, um, you know, do, are you going to try and change things from the inside? Let's say you work in a hospital or, you know, trying to get meat off the menu. I don't know. There's so many different theories of change and things um, that you could choose. And I would say, choose the ones that really resonate with you and that you feel most excited about and you know get people in your group who also feel excited by that so I, I would imagine there would be a core you come up with a mission you'll attract and find people who also resonate with that um, I think having real clarity around things like roles I mean the boring stuff like roles and accountabilities but it's boring but it's also really necessary if you don't want to end up um, like falling apart and hating each other by the end of it. I think we've all had experiences of that. <laughs> Anybody in the gallery had experiences of that? 
um, yeah, so really clear, like who's the coordinator, who's the culture person, who's the structure person, do you know how to run meetings effectively? Um, all of those really mundane things, but it will help you function really well. Um, and I think once you've got those, um, and, you've got, and I think also spending time building relationships and, and psychological safety and trust in that group, I think those are the ingredients for me to then, to really start, um, yeah, becoming effective um, and performing. And just to say, you know, these, you know, if you just wait, well, I don't know, not just wait, because we're going to be piloting in a few months and we're putting together handbooks for new groups, new members, we, you know, we've got this whole kind of, you know, the systems, I mean, our approach is to embed our values in the systems of a group and an organization. That's what we've done in ATT. You know, we've got a conflict transformation system. We've got a care and connection and support system. We've got a feedback system. We've got a decision-making system. Um, and we've got info flow and resource allocation system. And groups wow. need this. I so love this. This is like, for a productivity person, this is like, oh, music to my ears. And it, it's so, I mean, it's so important because like, otherwise um, we just rely on individuals to, you know, be brilliant all the time. And it's just, that's just not possible. But if it's, if, you know, if you've got systems that embed all of those things and are very clear and you have a process for what happens when you've got tension or um, you've got how to run meetings and, you know, our micro practices are really, really important. They, they seem trivial, but doing rounds, having a check-in at the beginning of the meeting, you know, all those things create the culture um, so there's, I'm just vomiting out so much stuff, but these are all the no, things that I think about and that we, that we've been embedding in Animal Think Tank and we're going to try and Im embed a sort of a light version, I suppose, on local groups because they're going to be volunteers. They're not going to have hours on end to talk about their feelings, but you know, mm. um, so I would say all of those things are really important. Mm, I love, you know, I, I love this idea because how much energy do we as activists spend reinventing the wheel? You know, when various things come up in, in our movements and our groups, it's just like, okay, well, we need to start from scratch. That's, we, there's too few of us to do that. We need systems yeah. so that yeah. some of that stuff is just taken off of our, you yeah. know, brain, uh, brain plate and we can just really concentrate on creating the new yeah. stuff, you know? So yeah. I love and, that. And that's wonderful. And that is exactly what we're trying to do with these groups. It's like we, we've done a whole load of thinking and reading and have mm -hmm. trying to give you, give the groups resources that they can actually use and that are straightforward and, and processes for them to then iterate and evolve them in the way that their groups go. Yeah. That, that's the vision. Um, so when is this some um, document coming out? And and Leila, can we ha have a Canadian arm of Animal Think Tank? Because <laughs> this sounds amazing. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that Animal Think Tank's own like handbook, it's on mm. Gitbook and it's publicly available. I don't know if it's on the website, but I can definitely share that because so much of Animal Think Tank's own, you know, we're an organization of full-time people. So it's going to look different to a local group sure. that's, Absolutely. you know, made up of volunteers um, who are only working a few hours a, a week or something. But I can definitely share that handbook and most of the things that we are thinking about for groups are sort of you know the ideas are in that handbook it's just we make we've made it more simple we are going to be piloting the group resources and toolkits um, between October and spring of next year that's our kind of next stage and then once we've refined them I think everything that we produce is going to be publicly available because we want as many people to benefit from it as possible. It's kind of like, yeah, have it, make it better. Yeah, um, and, and don't yeah. stop at the UK, honestly. Like yeah. we, you know, and so, so Layla, as soon as you have that, you're gonna send it to me and I'm gonna oh. distribute it to the uh, community, yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I also wanted to say that if anybody's listening and knows anybody in the UK or is UK based who is inspired by you know any of this, we're 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 trying to you know we're recruiting. We need another fifteen people to be able to really manifest this vision. Um, so mm -hmm. please do get in touch if any of this resonates with you. Amazing, amazing, mm -hmm. Leila. We have a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Do you are do you need to jump off right at one? No, and I feel like I've just seen somebody put the handbook in. Great. Uh, oh, the yes, chat. the handbook is in the chat. Thank Jay, you. you're, the, you, Jay. you're the winner. You're, you're so <laughs> awesome. I love Jay. Um, okay, awesome. Um, so if I can take a few extra minutes, Layla, um, because we still have almost 50 folks here on with us and, that haven't left us, and oh, I would like, like to honor some of these uh, people. Yeah. Um, and we've got a, quite a few watching on uh, the Facebook live stream, too. Um, okay, so Debbie is asking, um, could Layla speak to infighting? To me, I'd rather see 
see multiple groups focused on their own methods of activism mm -hmm. than just a few who waste time and energy among themselves fighting over what mm -hmm. is the best form of activism. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think it's important for all of us to support each other's actions in a show of solidarity for the animals. Your thoughts mm -hmm. now, you have a whole conflict resolution piece to yeah. your, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, I mean, I'm 100, I 100% agree. Um, and I think, yes, we, we've got, you know, conflict transformation system in animal think tank, but we don't have one for the movement. And I think what I was talking about with the ecology, um, I think is one of the sort of more root causes of a lot of the infighting um, in the movement, because it's, uh, uh, which is why I think it's so important to understand our own and others theories of change, because it's like, I mean, how many people have said about, you know, DXC actions, you're making vegans look bad and, you know, you should be doing outreach or whatever it is. And it's like, if you don't understand what they're trying to do, you're going to think, oh, this is making us look bad or what are you doing or whatever it is. So I think that's one piece of the infighting that I think could be cleared up by having a clear understanding of different theories of change and where different people are at in that, in that ecology and having, you know, respect. I also feel like we we each have a unique contribution to make. We each resonate with a different part or a different way. I, I might be brilliant at doing one-to-one -one outreach. I'm not, so I'm not <laughs> going to do that. I'm, I'm much better at doing research and coming up with, you know, systems. So, you know, I'm going to do that. Um, so I, I think- And the world is different, Leila. Every, there, there's so many factions in this world. So we need yes. so many factions of our movement to be able to um, reach out to all those different factions of the world. 100%. And I would also say that who knows what is the right way? I don't know. I mean, we, we're using the best, you know, that we that we have and we're doing the best that we can but who really knows I mean we're dealing with a complex system and it's going to take all of us and we're never get, it's not going to be linear it's going to be you know one change here is going to have some ripple effect here and we're not going to know that it came from here so it's I, I think it's futile and often when I when I think about and, and you know myself I'm involved in unwillingly in in conflict or tension I'm just like what about the animals like really <laughs> I mean we we've got so much energy and I think part of it is that we are so I mean I'm going off on one here but like we all of us carry wounds we carry core wounds from our childhood and most of that is in my language lady <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then and then we just project that uh, onto others and we have a filter and we you know we see everything through that lens of our wound unless we can create space inside and create some witness to be able to be like actually you know what maybe maybe this isn't exactly what I'm seeing maybe that's not what's happening here so I think there's so much of that so um, absolutely I, yeah. I I totally agree with that Layla that's the work I'm really involved in is is how do we how do we heal the wounds in the in the in the helpers in the in the change makers so yeah. that um, they can be more clear seeing um, and you know and put put most of your power towards the mission as opposed to feeding and and just trying to soothe your wounds kind of thing oh 100 percent and I, I I could do a whole other hour on this because yeah. this is like this is so interesting to me and it's really linked into this idea of feeling our own power and reclaiming our power we are constantly giving it away to others to tell us how to feel yeah. um and and that's governments that's also to the person that we're working with it, it just you know and we would be so powerful if we could just take it back but like there's all this healing to be done um, and yeah. I'm just like what potential do we each of us individually have we're not we're probably only 10 percent of our true full percent potential and that would be so massive for creating change in the world if we could focus on that rather than on fighting each other. Mm. Um, Jay, uh, Jay is asking, um, so uh, I wonder if allyship, uh, uh, if we could discuss allyship with environmental groups, um, mm. for example, how harmful factory farming is for the planet and that we need to migrate to plant based foods to stop the pollution that's created in this industry. Now, does your um, work with ATT, um, Layla, uh, talk a lot about intersectional uh, work with, with other social justice movements? So we've got this sort of deep ideology document that we're creating, which is kind of like, you know, all, all oppressions are connected and mutually reinforcing, et cetera, et cetera. This is just one piece of a bigger, uh, bigger, you know, piece. Um, we are, uh, we're about animal freedom and there's, because everything is connected, there are going to be different ways to get there. And I think the environmental piece, and I think, um, you know, the factory farming piece, actually, I think the food movement 
the animal movement and the environmental movement probably agree on so many things up to a certain point and we could probably make huge change um, through building coalitions um, in these movements and probably other movements as well and I think animal rebellion is a really good example of how um, you know I think originally well, one of the motivations I think for Dan who was you know one of the co-founders um, was shifting the the messaging that was coming out of Extinction Rebellion that was um, you know, that was ignoring the animals completely. And Animal Rebellion now has managed to shift the environment, well, XR's um, narrative. And you've got on social media, XR promoting plant-based foods, plant-based diets, talking about things that they weren't talking about before Animal Rebellion. And there'll be others who say, well, you can't, you can't work with other movements because they're not vegan. Well, how are you going to change if we can't, if, how are we going to change others if we can't be in relationship with them? So I think, right. um, I yeah. don't know. So, yeah. so I think, yeah, Animal Rebellion is a really good example of that. And for Animal Think Tank, we haven't fully uh, landed on our particular strategy, but I, I'm personally not ruling it out um, in terms of, uh, I think there's a lot of mileage in building coalitions and yeah, with other movements. Amazing. Um, okay, so I know I can't, I don't want to keep you any long, I mean, I'd love to keep you all day so we could talk, but um, <laughs> I, I need to honor your time and I need to honor our community's time because you're all valuable and you're all doing important things. Um, but one thing that I just want to um, ask uh, Layla is, uh, Nikki Robinson said, uh, hello, Layla, I'm UK based and would love to support. Karen Levinson said, um, I know several people in the UK, how do they get in touch with you? So what's the best okay. way of, of people getting in touch with you, Layla? I'm just going to put my email address in the chat. <laughs> it might take me a while to get back. Don't all email me. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're just like hey how you doing Layla what's up <laughs> no don't do that if you if you have some serious time and energy to be able to, to help then that's great well I think oh god I can't see without my glasses so let's hope that's right otherwise okay. just go to the animal think tank website um, that, and you'll looks, get the that looks right yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay amazing um and um and I, like I said I will keep you posted as far as um what Layla's uh the developments that happen with animal think tank and the resources that we could use um the uh the Santa's um I I saw your questions about asking about legality of, of sit-ins um why don't you post in the Facebook uh private Facebook group um where you're talking about because it really depends on 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 where the location is um, like uh country-wise and um and and we can try to help you with that okay um all right so um let's get back into gallery view kirsten if you can take layla and i off of spotlight so layla you can see some smiling faces that are nodding michael says i love this session oh. such a beautiful and clear overview of the ecology of change um jay said thank oh. you for answering the questions so many people in agreement um with with everything you've said um jenny said it this is uh been um such a helpful um uh what did you say jenny i've lost you but she was oh this is super useful thank you um jenny mcqueen is is one of canada's foremost activists uh and she's got her hand in everything so uh, that's that's high praise um so animal justice academy can we please give uh layla an animal justice academy thank you for her time her efforts to her her love her heart her brilliance all of it uh layla we are we are happy to import you anytime that if the uk is and treating you well come on over um if, if you don't can't stay at your sister's place you can stay at ours okay oh, thank you so much this well, has been so lovely yay okay well we'd love to have you on again maybe once those resources are out um yeah. folks i just want to remind you uh july 28th is our next animal justice life lunchtime live the topic is vegan investing 101 it's with uh justin manning who is a vegan financial advisor and i think justin's going to bring some guests with him so that we can cover a whole bunch Bunch of areas of vegan um, of investing in financial. So I hope you'll join us. And folks, I hope that you have found this inspiring. One of the biggest things, uh, you know, I'm going to take away from what Layla said is, is she didn't know she could start a movement. And all of us, you know, all of us can start our own little um, factions of this animal freedom movement. So um, figure out where where your little corner is, and um, and 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 let's get organized, and and let's let's get out there. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your week, Layla. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. And we'll talk to you soon, everyone. <laughs>